Hello, vintage computer friends. Today I have the Philips Masterlab MC6400 again on the bench, an educational computer system released by Philips in West Germany in 1985. And it's equipped with a very rare CPU, the National Semiconductors SCMP3, also called SCIMP, right? SCIMP3 or INS8070 is the code number for this ship and yeah very rare CPU so I'm happy to have this one and in this video I wanted to demonstrate the cassette interface of this machine to you and also for owners of this machine um, this might serve as a little tutorial on how to successfully um, store and reload programs to tape right because of all the vintage computer machines that I used and um, use the cassette interface with this is definitely the most delicate and most fiddly cassette interface that you can think of so it really um, requires extraordinary attention um, to the volume and tone levels for it to work and i think this is basically because they used a very uh, ingenious but also very minimalistic circuit in order to implement the cassette interface right also, I experimented with all kinds of digital storage devices, right? I also have a very nice Philips voice recorder, which records in PCM, not in MP3, right? Because PCM is obviously better because it's uh, not compressed, unlike MP3. But I couldn't get it to work with that, right? So your best chances of success are indeed, you know, a good old um, vintage retro style, um, you know, cassette recorder using real... Uh, tapes right and here I'm using my Panasonic program recorder which is doing a great job but um, I also tried with other cassette recorders and with those I had less success right so I'm going to uh, demonstrate how you can calibrate your cassette recorder for this to work and um, yeah, so one thing I would want to say uh, before we start is also the manual mentions this Basically, you really need to make sure that if your program or cassette recorder has a tone um, a, um, tone setting uh, um, dial, right, that you set this to bassy. So, um, so you want to have as little high frequencies as possible because the higher harmonics might actually confuse the, um, the interface. So it might trigger and detect additional transitions and hence bit flips, right? So you really want to have this to have uh, a dull tone and not a bright tone. So it's a low pass filter basically, right? And um, yeah, so let's have a look um, why this interface is ingenious, but also why it is very tedious and delicate. So the SCAMP3 has basically a, a register which is used to control the three digital outputs and the two digital inputs, the so-called flag register, right? So the way GPIO is implemented on this machine is basically um, directly um, over the CPU, right? In the flag register, we have three output flags, F3, F2, F1, which you can set basically with a machine language uh, um, instruction. And um, we also have two inputs, SA and SB, and those are also in the flag register, bits there, right, which you can, again, read out with uh, machine-level instructions. So the status of these inputs is always um, live, basically, can be observed live in the um, flag register in the CPU. And by setting with the instruction, with the machine instruction, those flags, basically, um, the cassette interface, um, firmware is creating the tones required to encode zeros and ones um, in the audible spectrum, right? So these three flags here, F1, F2, F3, are also the only outputs that the machine has, right? So also for experiments or so, those are the only output ports. So it has three digital outputs and only two digital inputs, right? SA and SB, which are also um, available as buttons here and those very same input outputs three outputs two inputs are also being used by the cassette interface right and the machine is actually generating the audio fully in software right so unlike other machines 
for example, the Bush Microtronic or so, if you look at its cassette interface, and it basically has an os oscillator which is generating the tone frequencies for the um, the tones for 0 and 1, right? Whereas here it's really the CPU which is generating the sound, the audio. So you see here's the CPU, there are the two flags F3 and F2 in the flag register, and those are just being summed uh, basically with the resistors, with the resistors here, and then the output is, is audio, directly goes into the into the cassette recorder and is being recorded as a as an audio signal, right? And um, for reading the spec, or actually before that, before we look at the input circuit of the cassette interface, let's look at the at the signals which are generated for F1 and F2. Uh, sorry, F2 and F3. So F2 is uh, one flag is pr it, the safe routine um, generates a digital signal which looks like this, and then flag 3 looks like this, and then using the resistors, those two signals are being um, summed, and this is then the audible and uh, the audio signal, right? Which is being recorded by the cassette recorder. And uh, now for the other direction to load programs back, the load routine, which is also basically just the CPU running the program which is looking at the um, bit toggles of the SB um, input, right? And trying to uh, figure out what, you know, what um, datum has arrived, right? And writing this into memory. So here's the circuit. So here we have the output from the tape recorder. Simply goes into an RC, right? So it's decoupled using a capacitor. Then it's just going into the base of an amplifying transistor, right? And um, <clears throat> this transistor then is being fed into an inverter here, which then is connected to the SB digital input of the SCAMP uh, 3 microprocessor, which can then observe basically the signal here, right? In machine language, just running tight loops and trying to figure out what arrived here. And so, yeah. And you see that's a very uh, minimal circuit, basically just a very few components on the board here, which basically do that. And that, I guess, explains also why, you know, these voltage levels here now need to be extremely precise. And another interesting thing to note is that the machine has a, a DIN socket, right? A standard <coughs> uh, five pin DIN socket, you can see that here. But the cable is actually not standard, right? So the um, computer comes with this special cable. And what's special about it is that it has um, a short circuit, a bridge basically here. You can see that here between pins 5 and 2, there's a short circuit. And um, that's required because <clears throat> you can see this in the circuit here. Um, basically, they need a naja, pull down resistor here, right? Um, in order to, and this is the bridge here, the, um, the circuit, right, which basically enables or disables this um, pull-down um, register, uh, sorry, pull-down resistor, otherwise the um, <coughs> this part of the circuit doesn't work. And um, for normal um, input operation, right, for experiments or um, inputs, over the SA and SB buttons, you do not want to have this cable connected because this will basically otherwise ground your um, SB input, right? But for the cassette uh, interface, it needs to be um, grounded here, otherwise the circuit doesn't work, right? But for normal operation, then you're then supposed to pull this, otherwise you can't, you know, use the SB input, which is of course also available here on the connector for experiments. So. Yeah, um, after these explanations, let's get practical, let's get hands-on, and um, so I first show you how to calibrate the cassette recorder and the volume levels, right? And there's a ROM program there that generates a test tone, which you can then record on tape, and you're trying to load that test tone back then. And uh, currently it's just running a demo program here, right? I Hello Spiele, so it's in German, Hello Games, right? So let me stop this. And instead, um, I'm starting the ROM program E, SPE, right, for ROM program E. And now you see that the LEDs F3 and F2 came on. That means it's now generating a test tone. 
we can listen to that, right? Um, here there's a monitor. That's the test tone. And we are going to record this test tone now for, you know, 10 seconds. Alright, so now that we have the um, test tone on tape, let's try to read that back. And for this we have another ROM program, SPF. And um, with that basically we can now get feedback observing the LEDs F2 and F1 um, to find the right volume level, right? So let me start the tape recorder. And um, you can't hear that because if I turn on the monitor then um, this will interfere also. So I'm starting the tape recorder now and we are trying to find a level now. So our goal is to have both F2 and F1 equally lit, right? So now F2 is barely lit, right? And so if I'm decreasing the volume then it's more fully lit, which is bad, right? And now you've got to increase the volume until basically it dims a bit. And now you see that F1, the green LED, also barely comes into um, barely comes on right so it's really hard to see here I think it's a little bit too bright here my light but you know if you increase the volume too much you'll lose that again right so it has to be about like this so this is perfect if the volume is too high you only get F2 so F2 and F1 like this and this is too low this is the perfect level all right, so the next thing I want to do is enter a little program that should be quick, which is basically just a simple counter, right? And um, then save this to tape and try to restore it from there. And uh, that way you also get a little bit demo of the programming experience um, one has with these kinds of machines. So with AD I can uh, change between address input and data input, right? And um, there's a little mark here basically which shows whether you are entering an address or, a, or or the data at that address, right? So so this is now it's pointing to this direction, right? Open to the right, then you can enter the start address and by default program start at address 1000 and now I'm going to enter the program C4 I'm not going to explain it with ME plus I can go to the next cell, memory cell and put in the next opcode right and so maybe at one point I do a video that explains a bit of the SCAMP 3 programming but for now we're just entering this little program so that we have something in memory that we can then store to tape and load back go back to 1000 hit run there you see it's counting albeit slowly but it does I think there's a probably a delay loop there, right? Zoom in so you can see it better. Okay, so let's try to save this to disk, <laughs> to disk, um, to tape, right? So we have our tape recorder calibrated, so hopefully that should be straightforward now. Just rewind the tape. Hit record, and then there is simply an, a save button, right? And you are specifying the start address 1000, and also um, the end address, and this was 10 20. Save, and there you go. So it's a, a fast interface, I have to say, it doesn't take long to save that. Let's just do that one more time. Okay, and now that we have the program on tape, let's try to load it back. For this, first we power down the machine to make sure that the memory is really gone and the program is gone. And as you know, the reset button doesn't do it, right? So we really have to power cycle the machine. And then you use the load button and now you are being asked to supply an address and uh, previously I thought okay so the program was at address 1000 let's load it back to address 1000 right 
But no, so this is actually an offset address and not the start address of the program. The start address of the program is by default on this machine at address 1000. And if you want to load it to a different address, then you can use this feature to add an offset basically. So the loading routine will then relocate your program to that address, right? Um, 1000 plus offset. But here we indeed want to use zero now. And that's also the default, and that means just 1000 plus zero, just load back the original program to where it was originally at address 1000, right? And then we start the tape now, and then you hit the load button the second time, and the machine then goes completely um, blank and dark, and right, you don't have any feedback over the loading process which makes it a little bit difficult, right? So unlike for the test tone, we no longer get the F2, F1 feedback and there it already came back, right? So you see if it comes back with uh, 0300, then this is a indicator of uh, a successful load. Now the program is starting at address 1000, which is the default address. So ideally if we just hit run, you know, and there you go, our program has been loaded back successfully. The counter is working again, right? So let me just show you what happens if you have a wrong volume level, right? And the um, load doesn't work as expected. So this volume level is, you know, at 1.3, 1.4, so very low, right? So if the volume is a little bit too high, then we might just get an error. Let's see how this looks like then. And there you have it, right? The display shows error. That means the volume level was either too low or too high, right, or the tone levels were incorrect. Okay, so you see how, you know, how little I turned the dial here basically, right, from 1.2 to 1.4 or something like this, that was already enough to uh, trip the system, right. All right, guys, so that's it for now. So hopefully, you know, the few of you which are proud and lucky owners of this nice machine, maybe that gave you some um, tips and hopefully some advice how to successfully store and load your programs. And yeah, thanks for watching and until next time, right? Take care. Bye.